our lecturer today. And so please, I um, will um, only ask our lecturer to rise. Professor Emmanuel Ibe Kachiku was born on the 18th day of December 1956 to the family of the late Honorable Justice Kachiku in Onichoko, Delta State. He attended St. Peter's Primary School of Washington from 1962 to 1967. In 1968, proceeded to St. Pius Lama School in Chippewa for his secondary education, after which he attended the college in his city for his higher school certificate from 1973 to 1974. In 1974, he gained admission to study law at the University of Nigeria, from where he graduated in 1978 as the best graduating student. As an aspiring legal practitioner, his next stop was the Nigerian Law School. He was called to the Nigerian Bar in 1979 after graduating as the best student in his set, winning five out of the available seven awards. Not satisfied with the height attained thus far, he proceeded to Harvard University in the United States of America for his postgraduate studies. He took the LLM degree with a distinction and once again graduated as the best student in 1980. Again, his quest for knowledge was yet to be satisfied. He immediately enrolled for the SJD, equivalent of our PhD degree at the same Harvard University. This time around, he not only graduated as the best in his class, he actually set the record of being the first to complete the doctoral program at Harvard University in one year and six months. advising capacities on 
the Isaba is a chimney. The Isaba is a chimney kingdom. They are just there. It's the devil of our kingdom in all those things. Madam Vice Chancellor, distinguished professors and great students of Unibet, our visiting professor is also the Okwaku of Okuta in Muslim. This is the person who will be our lecturer for today. I believe that we are greatly blessed to have him. I think he deserves a wonderful
जगह
I would have pushed you to the frontiers of tomorrow of oil. And I would have been able to draw your attention and the national attention to some of the looming, looming emergencies that we have as we begin to transit from traditional um, oil into the areas of um, uh, new technology oil, into the new generation oil. So we'll start today with looking at first at oil and global energy. And my, my talk today will be basis cover the oil and global energy sector, uh, to cover me and how I got into oil because of students, it will cover international energy transactions, it will cover the organizations that are active in the energy transaction space, it will cover the local legislations that we look for with sort of focus on here in Nigeria. And then we we'll look at a very, very important aspect, the energy transition challenge that the world faces today. And so we'll begin first with the oil and global energy sector. Now, like you all know, oil has a very checkered history. It started all the way from um, 365 BC, that's when first began to the first sense of oil. And in those days, the first samples of oil were drilled out of China using bamboo. And transportation of that oil itself was also by bamboo shoots. But those were not very commercial sized oil. But as, as time went on, uh, the activity of oil be, become, be, became very, very uh, engaging by virtue of the fact that the nuance of powering the entire world community was very, very challenging. So many players in the oil sector, 200 years ago, including China, Egypt, Texas, and Pennsylvania states. And in 1855, the Rock Oil Company, uh, whose managing director was Dr. Drake, began the very first commercial drilling of oil that you saw in the world. By 1870, of course, Rockefeller, using the platform of the Standard Oil Company, had begun to refine oil and, in fact, controlled about 80% of the massive population, um, the market, market for oil. Ultimately, Standard um, Oil Company was bought over by Exxon Mobil, which theoretically happened to be the company that I worked for very many years uh, before I transitioned into the public sector. Oil continues to be a product that is made in politics, very heavy politics. And, but that's the very nature of oil itself. The very nature of oil, the very nature of energy provision always is mad in politics. And you will find from the history of the entire global space in oil that those symptoms continue to, to emerge. By the time oil was then by the time OPEC was then founded in 1969, we saw the very first attempt by a cartel, by a global collection of producing states, to take absolute control of their own resource. Incidentally, we'll come to the role of OPEC in this, because I, I served as president of OPEC. By 1970s, of course, we had started weaponizing oil. It was no longer enough to produce oil. It became an issue of substance. So we saw the Arab Israeli war and the Golan High Five and the decision of Saudi Arabia to join a lot of other countries in banning oil export to certain Western countries. And because of the role that they played in Golan High Court, they knew that oil had become something. Oil had arrived on the scene, not just as an instrument of energy production, but also as an instrument of politics and warfare. And of course, since then, it has so continued uh, in the nature of oil. By 1980, Nigeria, for example, uh, had joined the free and in challenging the, the rules of apartheid in South Africa, um, it, it banned, it basically took over a good percentage of British BP holdings in Nigeria, that was our first story. Venezuela, of course, took over oil major assets, there's no more in the 20s and 30s. The Sudan, Western Sudan, South Sudan, was the South and Sudan war in 2005, Nigeria in Fakasi. And then, of course, 2022, the Ukrainian war, which is now ravaging. Have all seen oil as part participants uh, of, of the global war uh, in various dimensions. Of course, um, Russia was the first to apply this to the Ukraine war, banning sales of petroleum um, uh, products to Western allied nations. And those ones turned around, of course, and began to leave us to, to fill the gap. The Chinese invasion, and I need to call it a quote unquote, of African raw material centers uh, since 2010 in some part of that global. 
because we are seeing China pay a lot of investment through a commercial re-entry into Africa and looking at resource growth and resource takeovers. And of course, finally, the push for the zero carbon energy sources which began over 15, 20 years ago and is now approaching its very difficult proportions. Um, it's, it's also one of those global warfare. So, so you find the role of oil, the role of the, the need to supply energy to the world, to the world because energy in the wars of 2050 and above are going to be the key determinant of success or failure. Imagine if you had an army of 1,000 people and an Amortan assemblage of 1,000 tanks and you couldn't find fuel for them. What happens to your army? You're dead. So it's become so critical as an instrument of warfare. Um, and Russia has been able to say to us that when you fight a war, you look to your product, it's short of gas, it's short of petroleum products, it's short down the pipelines. Uh, to the West. Of course, at great cost to his economy, what did he do? He turned around and began to create relationships with, uh, with China. And so he's moved a huge amount of his, of his products down to China. He turned around and pulled out his, uh, the position of his stocks in Western stock exchanges and placed the, ruby, uh, the, the, the Russian rupee as the, 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 the currency with which you are going to buy the oil. The effect of that was that whilst in the first four months of the Ukrainian war, the, the, the Russian uh, currents went uh, down almost tenfold. Um, within a matter of four months, it got into the highest uh, peak of its assessment as a currency. Uh, and that there are lessons uh, to, for us to learn from that. Now let us go through the infographics and see just and make one of them and just see what uh, you can see from there. It's pretty far. But what I tried to do was through infographics tell you what the, what the graphics are showing on the world global plane. These are the oil and gas economies in the world. Uh, and you can see the key participants are the major companies. Saudi Aramco is by far probably holding about 40 to 45 percent of the uh, global index uh, 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 category. Uh, and that's, that's huge. That's about two trillion you know, in, in, in asset placement. Far higher than Exxon Mobil, far higher than Chevron, far higher than quite a lot of other, other, other um, companies that you see. Let's go to the next one. These are the top five crude oil producing countries in the world. And if you look at that, you see United States, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Canada, and Iran. Not many people know that the United States produces more oil than um, uh, Saudi Arabia. We all know Saudi Arabia as a king king of oil. But you also see from the next graph that there's a difference between producing oil and oil reserves. Uh, producing oil is a, is a portion of your finance, your technical ability, your IT technology. Okay? And, and you can see Russia and Russia and the United States are high. So you ask the question why therefore does the US continue to import oil? Because you find that its production is less than its consumption, it's an important difference. But uh, in the last five years, it's obviously ramping up to about 90% of its total needs. And I think in the next five years, the US will become a uh, net centralized area for the world in Portugal. Let's go to the next one. Yes, go. Which countries have the most oil in the world? Uh, you see the US, but you see the highest is Saudi Arabia at 258 uh, 600 million barrels. And of course, um, there's one other country, Venezuela, is actually has more um, global oil resources than, than Saudi Arabia has. But you see the key players around Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, uh, UAE, um, Nigeria is not on that list. Of course, Nigeria, Nigeria has oil, which is a very small portion of oil parity. Now, oil comes with obvious pollution. And oil disasters, and this graph gives you the most oil spills that you've had all over the world. And you can see so many of them. And some of them run into billions and billions of dollars in claim. One group that is not there is, of course, the Niger Delta of Nigeria, which is, seen, which is revived as the highest oil pollutant environment in the world. Because why these are one time sporadic events uh, which get cleaned up or get paid for? The Niger Delta spill is a continuum. It's happening in every day. And if you go to places like the Lakota and Small Oil Producing areas and see the amount of flaring, the amount of disruption that are occurring, it is it is one place. Yes. Leading investors in oil production ten years. 
over the last 10 years. Uh, and why this is important is that you may have all the oil in the world, you don't have the money to be able to process the oil, you have to drink your oil. So you need the financiers, and these are the over the last 10 years that the ones who have come up. So even the oil companies like that are, like one I work for, although they are major, but they bring in money, the money is not necessarily their money. They are able to use it their next valuation, go to places like this, raise the finance that you need and be able to do the exploration. So they bring the technology, they bring the finance, they bring the management. And that's what makes it global come. The biggest oil finds in the last 10 years, and you can see the countries that have uh, the experience that. Uh, the only African country on that list is Mozambique because of its two very huge gas discoveries over the last 10 years. Um, the next set of graphs, let just explain it. The next set of graphs, uh, this one is important. It tells you where your energy solutions are going to come from. And you can see that oil increasingly is beginning to diminish as a supplier of total portions for energy provision of the world. Now, what, what do these infographics tell us? First is that there's going to be continuous increase in energy consumption. As communities grow, as civilization continues, the energy consumption is going to continue to, to grow. Second is that vast oil reserves uh, there are vast oil reserves all over the world. We probably have discovered only about 30 to 40 percent of the oil reserve that is actually existing in the world. And those are both discovered, proven, produced, and undiscovered. There are vast oil reserves. There are new IT capabilities. There are new IT capabilities available for oil discovery means that 5D seismic studies uh, soon come. And I know for a lot of students who say, What is seismic study? Uh, those of you who do geology, uh, it is the sheer magic of discovering oil through being able to interpret soil movements. And we have 1D, 2D, 3D, when I need threshold of 4D, and there is in fact a 5D of coming. The reality is that very soon, the data interpretations of available oil will not be done in the world, it will be done out of space. And then it will be easy to tell which person in the world will see how to find the faster collection of oil. There will be cheaper oil in the future. Definitely. Which means that there will be more available oil because of cost factors. Never mind very high prices now. But the market for oil will shrink. Because although it will become cheaper, everybody is now focused on a new generation of zero carbon emission and means of energy. Cheaper oil, of course, means that the challenges from shale oil, which nearly crippled the oil industry between 2015 and 2016, is going to return. And what is shale oil? What, what, what happened was that there's a system called fracking through which you can actually go to rocks, go to soil formations and be able to extrapolate oil through hand surfaces. It is usually very expensive. The average cost of finding oil today uh, in a typical oil reserve resource environment is about 30 to $35. It should actually be down to about $15 in some cases. Saudi Arabia finds oil at about $9 to $10. You can see the sort of margin that it has. We, at the time I left uh, the government, I think we're finding oil at about $15, $16. Oh, sorry, we're back at $15, $16, I think we're at about $20, $21. But it will cost you about $40 to $45 to find shale oil. So the fact that I've there was there, those things are basics of shale oil available all over the world that nobody touched. And why did they not touch them? Cost. In 2016, however, the price of oil was so high that all the nations that had access to shale oil went back to the land and began to look for greener technology, cheaper technology, and to produce shale oil. And so suddenly, they found that to produce shale oil at somewhere in the neighborhood of about $32, $33 a barrel. It meant, therefore, that oil from non oil resourced environments, when you say oil from deep offshore, were far more expensive to find than shale oil. Suddenly, so we had a body of oil producers, and that's where American made up most of the doubling of its oil production over a period of 10 years. Those who had access to that technology and had the funds to do it started creeping off the ground. And so, overnight, we had a major competition in this sense. So, the point I'm making here is that even though oil will be going cheaper much time because of technology, as 
the fact that the technology has helped substantially will even make shale oil even cheaper and so there will be a huge amount of competition uh, for OPEC and the likes of oil producers. The other thing that comes out from this ground is that there will be alternatives to oil. We are all looking for zero carbon emissions and so any oil that is zero or carbon free Once he pays, like a typical judge, once he's paid your fees, he expects you to deliver. 
he doesn't have time for pampering. So when I saw him uh, in my school that day, I was a bit, I was a bit scared. He said, it's not like my father, if somebody was about that guy or something, or had done something wrong, the professor had reported me, but I was still doing school. And so he came in and he said, let's go for dinner. That's not like my dad. So anyway, I joined him in the car, we went to have a good meal. Uh, the students, you know, that was going to buy for a good meal. It's a good thing. Right? So I went to have a good meal. And then, uh, in between that, of course, my heart was, uh, you know, pumping up. So I actually, when I finished eating, it wasn't to be rushed. He said to me, like, you enjoy the study of medicine. I said, well, I like it. He said, why did you want to study medicine? And he asked yourself, I said, I'd like to call the doctor. I said, oh, it's a title that you're after. I said to me, do you know you can also be called a doctor by going through you know, another stream of education in which you read to PhD level that like, is really a serious doctor? I said, oh, really? And he said, by the way, I've just received an admission for you for law. I'm not trying to influence you to leave medicine and go and read law, but if really what you have to ask to answer doctor, plan to read law to PhD level. But the most exciting part he said is that this is coming with a scholarship. And that means a lot for my very dry pockets. Paying for six years for you to study medicine versus paying versus not paying anything for four years for you to study law, I will choose law. And so by the time I had to finish that conversation, the very next morning I was on my way to Osaka to go study law. In those days you didn't have much say anyway. <laughs> But looking back, I think that singular movement into the law profession opened up the vista of opportunities uh, that it's landed.
mean, you did very relate like you did say to our form for example, 10 years, work for Tetsako, chef on Tetsako for 10 years, uh, recently at some of the executive vice chairman of the Nigeria South West of Africa. Been able to run my private petroleum business before uh, I even went to Exxon Mobil. I've been lucky to have spent at least five years in the public sector, one as my director of NNBC and four as new sub states of petroleum working with Texas and the of the I've been consulting in this field for the last five years since I've last four years since I left. I've been working as a global pro uh, roving professor various institutions around the world over the last three years. But what are the lessons, uh, in these are statistics and numbers, and even not unless you can interpret them. What are the lessons from this experience? The first is that education is very important, let nobody deceive you about it. Whatever you are doing, education is key. And if you are here, remember that you are playing your first few steps to what's going to be your um, journey around the world. The second is that intelligence and education are well, just enablers. Your success is dependent on one God's grace. Your opportunities are coming your way. Hard work, very hard work, and taking a leap of faith. By the time you leave law school, many of you will not know which area your career trajectory will take you. But what is important is that whatever the area is, there is always an opportunity and a need for a leap of faith. It doesn't matter what it is, even if it's saturated, you come in there, you make a difference. Even if it's better, you come in there, you create an idea. Even if it's non existent, you come in there, you establish it. So it is important that you understand that just being to school, going to school, is not enough. You've got to have those rudiments to succeed. It's also, my trajectory also tells me that people are the engines of your growth, they are the instruments of your growth. The friendships that you along the corridor of movement is very key. People you sometimes you neglect, I think they're not relevant. They become your saving grace tomorrow and offer you the opportunity you never thought you would have. And I tell you that when I became a GMD or Minister of State Petroleum, I never knew the president, I never met him. I never campaigned, I'm not a politician. I, I'm a technocrat, I'm a manager. And, and it took somebody who believed in Nigeria without having to mention the name. I took somebody, but then a group of people also, who said, no, no, we need to do something with this talent that is in there. And he came to my house to sell me the concept of living my very cozy job uh, to come join the public sector. But then I was vice executive vice chairman of the Mobile. And it took a lot of convincing because I didn't, I didn't believe the public sector. It was too difficult, too much politics, too much abuses and chaos. But that individual also asked me one question, what is the legacy? Want to live. Because you have a good career in the private sector, you live a very comfortable life, lifestyle, you travel all over the world, the private jets that are produced by the company. But if you step out of that comfort zone when you retire, who will recognize you on the street? And it occurred to me that I really had been playing in the international forum and I was a regular in Nigeria. And so I took that job living. And he said, before you are sent, if they offer it to you, please think of what you want to achieve in those one or two or three years. It's a very determined career. But imagine even a career that's willing to get into a field where you're not even sure what the tenure is going to be, what the politics will be. You have to go there with a the mind to make a difference. And so when I was first then offered the position to, to come, sir, it was by the grace of God, it was by the happenstance of man, and it was by the leap of faith, it was by the opportunity presented by him, including his excellency the president. The rest is history. So I watch you as you listen to me today and as you say to yourself, what will I end up doing? I have gone through uh, what you might call a presumptive career plan that has changed so many multi-dimensionally over the years. I've tried to be an insurance perfectionist after listening to Joe or Paul. I've tried to be somebody who was a lot messy to specialize in, in, you know, in forensic law around the medical area. I've tried to do litigations and I've worked as an international adjudicator in the US. I've, I've talked of being a corporate law expert. I've talked of energy. 
what I'm saying is, don't be worried that as you sit here today, you don't know where you're going to head. First thing first, get the basics, get the education. The education and your lecturers, the way you interact with your lecturers, sometimes your career is going to be determined by just how you how much you talk to a professor. Just that alone. The way he carries himself, the way he talks about the field, the future that you see alone, is probably the first determinant. The first determinant will be how your parents encourage you. And then finally, who are those role models you see out there who you think you can copy? But at every given stage in your life, you're going to move from point to point, career to career dream. Never mind, dream on. This is your time to dream. You are the age where you should dream. But once you finish at the law school, dream must then move from dreams to actual practical steps to achieve your goals. Yes, let's look at this field at the top, international energy transactions. This field covers so many things that if I Take you hours. I'm just going to be very brief in terms of saying to you that this subject will be resonant for us. And I'll point you more to the learning curves from these issues. International energy transactions will cover international organizations, uh, the focus, the legal regulations, will cover free trade in this area, and the liberation, uh, liberalization, sorry, of the market for the work of CATS and the work of the country balance trade trade organization. It will cover your fiscal and tax issues. How the governments get the money out of this oil that they own. It will cover sovereign and ownership rights. Who owns oil? How do you have a quasi ownership by virtue of your licenses and agreements that you have? It will cover environmental protection issues. How do you deal with these villages that we talked about? It will cover basic legislation. Uh, it will cover constitutional issues because remember that the fundamental wrong norm for control of minerals is, is in the constitution. Um, it will cover all kinds of theory, pricing and cartelism. How do you deal with that? It will cover antitrust issues. Um, America is busy over the last 10 years trying to sue OPEC for antitrust. Uh, they haven't, and each time they file the action, they will draw it once the price of oil is low, and they go back in when the price of oil is high. So it will also cover the, uh, global oil politics. It will cover licensing rules and regulation. It will cover contractual frameworks, which I'm sure in class will study and will be more details. In your JOAs, your PSCs, and your SCs. It will cover financial intermediation and collateralization. How do you find the money? How do you secure the money for the product that is not seen? It will cover environmental issues like pollution and abandonment, abandonment of fields by the time you finish the production. Um, like I said, no product that I know of is as politicized as oil. So you better brace up for the politics of oil itself. Now we look at all the international organizations that have gotten involved in the politics of oil. OPEC was founded in 1960. Let's start with OPEC. OPEC was founded in 1965 by a of countries Saudi Arabia, uh, in Qatar, Iran, and a few countries. And, and the whole idea of this uh, countries was basically to try and take a very aggressive control over the ownership of their resources. The second mission was in accordance with the statute to coordinate the time unify the petroleum policies of its member countries. OPEC has been fairly successful in shaping global demand, global pricing, and although we pride ourselves in OPEC as saying that our intent is to make sure that both the consumer and the producer are happy in reality that the cartel protects only producer. In 2016, I was privileged to go to be the, the president of OPEC. And that year, the price of oil came in, the price of oil had been measured uh, all the way down to about $18, $19 a barrel. And that was by a simple, there's no product that I know that is affected by a simple happenstance as much as oil is. The simple reason was that Iran and Saudi Arabia were in major disagreements uh, over territorial issues. And so Saudi Arabia decided that since it had more production, not more reason, this is going to it had more reserve, more production, but Iran was led in reserve oil. He decided that it was going to drop, listen to the Western nations and drop the price of oil. So it began to massively produce oil. So from the 10 million barrels it was producing, Saudi Arabia probably has a total 3 million barrels capacity to produce. Uh, so they have a lot of wells that are produced, that are discovered and capped, and just left them ready to be opened up uh, when there's a need for. 
So it moved from 10 million barrels uh, to 12.5 million barrels over uh, within a period of two months. Of course, the price of the oil throwing 2.5 million barrels of oil into the space, the price of oil crashed. And so the question was, OPEC was no longer able, as a united body, to enable the take policies that would force the price of oil to remain stable. Above, above, I'm sorry, below $30 a barrel, most OPEC producers are bought. Saudi Arabia can produce oil at $10 a barrel and it's making up to $1.5 So it's its production levels are very low. Production costs. Nigeria, like I said, we're aspiring for 15, 19, 19 West in now. When I left, we're about 22. I think it's going to be a worse now because of the production point. So our price will rise probably in the 40s. So if therefore, if therefore, sorry, you have a situation where oil stops on the sub, oil stops on the oil stops on the and prices are plummeting, the West is enjoying, the market is celebrating, um, Saudi Arabia is not necessarily celebrating, the margins are very low, but they are achieving their political goal. So the only way that we could solve that was for me to sit down with uh, Saudi Arabia and sit down with the government of Iran and do a, a good spreadsheet analysis to show them what we were using by the year. And that this money didn't really belong to the government, it belonged to the citizens. As you can see, this multi dimensional amount is not very important. Nigeria was losing well not even on the table. But as president of the had to take the lead that, and eventually we decided to bring in, they decided to sign a settlement agreement and then proceeded to bring in Russia and the greater voice of the OPEC plus. The OPEC plus made up of countries uh, that were not too pro free trade, uh, like Russia, as well as Russia and some of the past countries, and brought them into the fold to be able to cooperate with us, four or five of those countries. We have the reasonably size that we saw on the channels. Russia is probably the second largest producer in the world. And so brought them together. The effect of that was that suddenly we signed an agreement with the OPEC Plus. And prices of oil moved from $18 a barrel to about $17 a barrel in a matter of one and a half weeks. And since then, it has largely stayed there. Of course, the next happenstance was the Ukrainian, the Ukrainian uh, uh, the war, which took prices all the way. First, before Ukraine was, of course, the global pandemic. That was so far. That first took oil up over hundred dollars a barrel, and then the Korean oil took it over hundred twenty dollars a barrel. Whenever you have those situations, well, that's a walk of OPEC, and that's the uh, it is a very exciting thing that left OPEC happy. Uh, we have achieved a lot of help in Nigeria, uh, and raised its price, but also getting an exception from the OPEC was those days. Ultimately, we left with uh, the next some uh, backing of. Uh, to let us open the Secretary General who went on to serve uh, two times before uh, dying on the of his departure. You have bodies like United Nations International Agency, IPD, whose job is to look at total energy supply and mix and find a way you can balance that to ensure that there's a stability of that energy supply in the world. You have bodies like the International Mar the Maritime Organization, which is really sea effect, revive effect to transportation. Keeping, uh, keeping the sea uh, environments free for, for movements of oil vessels. But more important, addressing the issues of pollution both on sea and on land. And so some of the conventions that they designed in 1969 and 1975, uh, the International Convention on Civil, Civil Liabilities for Oil Pollution, uh, International Convention on Establishment of International Fund for Compensation for Oil Pollution, all have become very uh, critical problems uh, in areas of pollution control and compensation. We have a World Trade Organization which are one very respectable, uh, Dr. Kondre Kukuwala well, is now Secretary General of uh, who deals with the GATS series of contracts for those who study business law that are very familiar with GATS, which are general agreements and trade. And the whole idea is to ensure that there's an even playing field and that when you apply the most favored nation clauses, they're not badly disruptive you know, to the, the, the effects of free flow of trade. And of course, we had a long time conference which also had dealt with trying to protect the third, the third world from some of the global effects of massive trade globally. Now, of course, you have effects of national oil companies like an NBC, Saudi Arabia, the rest. For first time, Saudi very good strong media governments will they share participation in oil transactions and in geodates. And, 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 and how they will perform ultimately becomes crystal and important in terms of how well you are able to hold your resources. There was also the, there's also the GCF, uh, which is the Gas Exporting Countries Forum. I was president of that also in 2016. 
and the whole idea is to expand the frontiers of gas utilization, gas research, and gas uh, uh, protection uh, in international trade. Of course, there's the back of the African Petroleum Producers Organization, uh, which is a combined of all the ministers of petroleum who superintend the uh, oil ministry all over Africa and was president of that for three years until I left and uh, helped in beginning a major push to make it relevant, not just as a soft arm of the but as a critical arm of development of oil finance. We eventually went into Central and Apple Fund, which is now trying to generate the first one to two million resource in a really fund oil transactions. That's, that's the sort of nature of politics. You can, so you can see how globally important this politics is and how many people really do participate in this environment. What are the lessons and expectations from all this? First is that there's no morality about investment. That there are a lot of times you spend time worrying about what multinational to do, how to refer to the country they are. That's, that's an intellectual discussion. The company is set up to make maximum profit. If you set up your business, that's what you do. They would look at your law, pin your trade, and find purpose and make maximum investment. That is absolutely legal. The responsibility for protecting your country is yours, it's not those of the world company, so there's a lot of confusion about it. Investors will structure for highest profits and they give monetary responsibilities to the states. The cheapest sources of oil are located in areas where there is finance, there is technology, there is skill, and there is reserve. So Saudi Arabia is a typical example. If you have one of those components and you don't have the reps, you will be an expensive area for a transaction. Security will always be key in oil transactions. And you see when I'm saying Nigeria has suffered is that like, a lot of those who have blocks or who have businesses will tell you that the first thing that they worry about is when they find this oil, buy things, half of it is not true. Some still you know some 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 issues. Another day we'll discuss uh, how relevant the statistics that you hear in terms of so and all that is uh, in reality in Nigeria, but it's not, that's not the topic for today. Owners of resource must follow the global energy laws as it moves. And you behave or perish with your resource if you don't. In other words, when there's a shifting movement of en energy acquisition, of energy utilization, you must follow that law. What are you doing to catch up? The problem with Africa, like I said, is that most guys were two or three steps behind the curve. Abundant natural resources do not guarantee freedom from poverty. Uh, make no mistake about it. Resources don't guarantee freedom from poverty. Sensible resource harnessing and application is what guarantees freedom from poverty. How do you use that resource? Nigeria's 30 year oil reserve and 80 year gas reserve may be overtaken by technology. I showed you that but once you introduce the five key elements out of space, you can actually tell where all the oil is. And I think literally from what we're seeing, every country has some level of oil in terms of quantities the issue. And so if you do not catch up with technology quickly, you'll find that the day will come soon and projections about 25 to 30 years, those who have no oil who have not been able to do anything with it, you'll be left with oil in the domain that you don't know but nobody will want it. So we need to double our current resource production. That size in production and refining. Um, things that keep you at 1.5 million, 1 million barrels of production a day, you have a natural capacity of 4 to 5 million barrels a day. You must have those positions. You must deal with them. So you can so we can only process of utilizing your oil. Then you must go into value added. Value added means that not just send food for crude. That's what we do with agriculture. We send raw agricultural materials, we don't process. When you don't process, you don't capture the margins. So unless you do that, you will not be able to deal with the surplus resources that you have in your ground uh, when the time comes for energy transition to begin, and it has been done. Resource countries like Saudi Arabia and Qatar are less protective of the resource, but more protective of the earnings. In other words, your eye should be on the money. I tell this example very many times of a good friend of mine who used to play this music on uh, ADC airlines that uh, full capsule corn. He, he 
logs line and the of the nature and they always treat the environment it's just a lot of being in there. And so one day we have a lunch and he said, I will fly the elephant. He said, how will you survive the long flight? He said, well, you know what? When I flew to Calabar and came back, my banker was waiting for me on the ground. And as soon as we declared the aircraft and finished the formalities, he took me over to his side and he said, you know what? Every time I come to ask you, they say you're off there, you're flying. If you don't stay on the ground and deal with the financial issues, I will need to fly very soon. So the reality is <laughs> that resource countries should have their life focused on the revenue. Stop being overprotective over the resource. How are the agreements looking? What am I going to get? How do I capture? That's why the national um, um, logo content was probably one of the laws, best laws ever passed in this country. So you must have your eye on how you get the benefits of, of, of that. Funding is key. Oil is an enabler of funding is key. Resource countries must learn to save and build their sovereign wealth funds. The country that has done that, one was, you know, of course, is Saudi Arabia and Qatar and a couple of them. They are there for their sovereign wealth funds are so huge that they cannot take any transaction. And that's why they can afford to mutilate it. I'll show you as they have the President of America to see. So funding is key. How can we help the value of the Naira using oil? Well, the examples are in Saudi Arabia and Russia. Saudi Arabia floated, decided three years ago to float. Uh, two trillion, and you see that the stock exchange it's floated only about 15% of that. But it insisted that it had to float in the Saudi stock exchange. The fact of that really shot the Saudi stock exchange to the global phenomenon. Russia decided to go to war and said the first part they did was that nobody would buy Russian products except the Russian currency. The fact of that we shot the currency. So imagine what will happen if about 15 to 20 percent of our crude oil is sold in Naira and retail dollars. The value of Naira and Oil and Gold will also have an effect on that. And let's look at energy transition as a rounding up loss. I don't want to let you guys see me here. What is happening? Um, so many organizations all over the world. So many organizations all over the world began a, a, a quick process of energy transition. That is the future of energy. And I've seen so many materials in terms of the local local legislation, the constitution, the EID, the Logic Act, and all that. The EID and all those that is.
Holiness Spirit. We came back from COP26 and we launched what we call the 2016 ETP, ETP, Energy Transition Plan, which highlights the scale of efforts required to achieve 2016 net So if you take the 2016 as our target date versus today, and we're looking at roughly about 35 years, 37 years, uh, versus 10, uh, versus 5 in Saudi Arabia, versus 10 in the US. At the core of our plan is to lift 100 million Nigerians out of poverty and drive in economic growth. And not just that, we're sure what that means. But keep hearing you say every time lift 100 million Nigerians out of poverty. Yes, you don't lift people out of poverty, you give them instruments to find themselves out of poverty. Bringing modern energy services uh, to the full population. Again, we have not moved substantially in this over the last 10 years in terms of energy supply. But yes, if you can achieve that, it certainly will help. Managing the expected long-term job loss in the oil sector due to reduce the oil obviously. Once you transit, a lot of jobs will be lost in the oil sector. But then, you will transit to another form of uh, energy employer. Playing the leadership role for Africa by promoting a fair and inclusive equity, equitable energy transition in Africa that will look at as a transition of oil. And yes, they did well in this. The fight by African countries, the fight by the economic countries, forced gas as a transition of oil. Otherwise, gas will be taken out. And then we're looking at new energy related initiatives. It is will require an investment of close to 100 150 million billion dollars. Uh, that's the money we don't have. So, obviously, uh, the best that we can do is to create regulatory environments that force money to come from elsewhere. And so, what again are the, are the critical opinions of the future? Oil, the relevant for the next 50 years, because of high cost of alternatives, it's going to take a while before you can find a cheap oil, a bit cheap alternatives. So we still have a issue of 40 to 50 years. But it's not 40 to 50 years that is current consumption levels. 40 to 50 years are depleting consumption levels. So if income from that will change. The nature of trading in oil will also change. Because once the resource owners have been the leads, the consum consuming nations such as become the leads. So it becomes very important that we need to focus on regional markets and protect certain markets for ourselves. Because European markets will not be available and Asia markets will be available by within the next 10 15 years. Already American markets that the Americans are allowed. Energy transmission is no longer just a buff or a joke, it is a reality. We should expect an upsurge. Well, renewable energy sources over the next 30 years. Some estimate that oil will decline as a global source and renewable energy will increase to 50 to 75 percent of the world's energy sources. That's, that's a huge replacement. The other indication is that smart energy countries will do so transit quickly to renewables. I've gone to many conferences that you've been talking. Most of the African ministers will come and say, no, this is this is colonialism in a different form. There's nothing wrong with our oil. We're fine. We are global warming, global warming indices and uh, and, and uh, sorry, uh, bridges are in the two to three percent of world uh, global warming warming percentage. We're not in, we're not in global warmers, basically. But but the world is a village. It, it doesn't matter whether you're one percent or five percent or zero percent. When they move, everything moves. The market moves, the financing moves, the management moves. And so you are stuck with your oil if you don't make it, um, take the steps to buy for that. So smart oil producers will also be the ones who increase local value added and refined crude. And, and I, I, I've got you to uh, ask that there's a need for us to raise up our refining and to refine it coming up. It's sorry, it doesn't matter. It's good. And then this refinery is most common. Private refineries were the way we registered about 10 modular uh, refineries in my time. Four of them are producing now, small quantities, but they are producing. We need to move massively on looking for value added to our country. The Middle Eastern countries, particularly the Arabs, are chasing developed countries and developing energy sources uh, and that are going to be added more renewables. So Nigeria has a lot of catching up to do. The ETP requirement is about 150 billion to fund money we do not have. What are the options for Nigeria there? Creative regulatory framework, right incentives or renewables, right to put creative.
focus on infrastructure while we still have funds. We're still very infrastructure deficient and we need to borrow. Reduce expenses on services, administration, cost, and recurrent expenditures in a maximum of our system. More funds to be put on research, application, and conversion to renewable sources of abundant solar and wind and gas resources. Set target dates for zero export of crude oil. It is important we need to look at the date. I've suggested about 2035 when you say no more 100% crude export, you will sell crude as a refined product. You will have value for yourself. Finally, time is ticking. The world is on a race. No country can afford to simply stand and watch. And I thank you for listening.
money. You know, like the key feature of service contracts, and what I'm going to type service contract is, is money. Uh, you can't do a service contract if you don't have relatively 100% of the funding in your hands. Because service contract, you have put in a service contractor to do the work and you pay the fee. When you don't have the money, you can imagine going offshore to deal with uh, a, 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 a kilometer uh, debt of oil, which are the life you have in the PSS. And you hand aside the funding. We have not been able to. We need, we consume literally everything that we earn and we borrow on top of it. So you should have the money for you then to go and get a contract or pay to do uh, a deep offshore loan. It's very difficult. Obviously, with time, in the likes of Africa and Zimbabwe, uh, the likes of. Uh, uh, there's no bank in this country with put and the, the financial capability to fund major oil exploration and, and, and production contracts. So that's outside it in terms of the networks. So it's all offshore bank, and that's why I give you those 10, 10 companies that have the money over time. If you countries with very huge sovereign wealth, both in Europe and Middle East, are doing well, they are really able to offer service contracts. Saudi Arabia is more like this. They so much in service contracts that pay you a fee and take that money and you work. Uh, but we're not there yet, um, unfortunately. Uh, PSCs, of course, uh, enables you to find somebody who has the money, has the technology, or just to say, takes because a huge portion of the entitlement, usually 70 to 90, and you keep that, but at least it keeps the drilling going. That's the future. Future is a long way. Future will have, I, I, the way we are going in Nevada, they will catch up with that future before it is passed. Yes. Thank second, you, sir. Second, second question was on. Uh, why? The first question was a no technology transfer by the world. Um, I, I think just like the fields of medicine, just like the fields of law, uh, fields of IT, uh, fields of entertainment, Nigeria really is surrounded by people. Uh, there is absolutely no no site for inspiration in Nigeria. I mean, there is no site for it. Uh, Engineers have been okay. So, so technology has been passed, and the effect on the uh, 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 the, the local content law that I told you about was that it required employment was the key move first to Nigeria to find anybody else. You only go outside if you don't find somebody. It employed it even went further to say that the contracts in the sector must be given to Nigerian companies with at least fifty percent Nigerian ownership before you go elsewhere. It required. It required that certain materials you use was the Nigerian made. So, for example, look at the pipeline industry for those who are active here. If you want to uh, apply, get a contract for pipeline to lay pipe or something, the uh, local content board will not allow you to do that unless you go to the companies that have opened up shops here saying that they want to produce pipes. So, they give them the contract report for you. Just to encourage them to make money as they do that. So there are lots of laws that encourage that. Unfortunately, of course, no pipe has been produced in Nigeria. So even when they get those contracts, they say they're going to produce pipe. They've not started as well as they have for 10 years. The, the, the reality about this country is that whatever thing we do, people find a way of circumventing them. And we have to become very principled about them. It was my given example that I had, but I think it's too much time. When, when I joined, for example, there was a lot of plan for, for us to have marginal fuels issues. And when people came to me, I, I said I wasn't going to do it. Um, I wasn't a minister, but I decided to advise the minister not to. Because um, I was a minister of state. And, and everybody was saying, why would you do that? I wouldn't do that because of the 90 um, um, marginal field licenses that were given prior to the time I came, only three were. So about 87 were becoming certain because of what we are that you in your house. As so I said, before I do that, I want to cancel all marginal licenses that have not started after 10 years. And if you know the amount of pressure that went to the presidents on trying to take away their rights that they have fought hard to have. Because if most Nigerians get this license and all they're looking for is to find somebody who's going to buy it off them. On their false name to go and produce. And so nobody's really pursuing that. So, but we've just issued 40 new marginal licenses, so probably we'll have around 30 now. I'd like to see how many are producing. So it, it, it's the, the, the issue is how do we become very impartial in the enforcement of laws that the public system Yes, second question. Thank you. 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 Thank 
Yeah, I was going to say. Alright. Um, I just want to ask my question. I want to say that your lecture was very impactful. I, I speak on behalf of my fellow students that we have learned a lot. Thank you, sir. Okay. So my question was that, or is that, during your, during the course of your lecture, we were talking about energy transmission or transition. And you said that energy has transited from coal to crude oil to gas and soon to be used in renewable energy. And he said that there was a problem when they were talking about gas, that gas has been chosen as a transitional form of energy that is has its own hours effect. So I want to ask this question. What are these effects of gas and what plans is the government or is the world in general planning or what plans do they have to halt the effects of this, of this gas before the advent of the new energy to replace this gas? That's the question I have. is not only gas itself. Uh, gas is slightly cleaner energy than crude, but it's not a zero uh, carbon, um, uh, carbon energy source. So when the world met in various protocols, they said, look, we need to phase out all these uh, things that do not have zero. And crude was first, and the second was gas. But, but you wanted to phase it at that time when there are no renewables. Of course, the renewables are very expensive. Uh, it's not there's no one for one replacement factor yet between renewables and some of these uh, uh, historical energy sources. So eventually when Europe realized that if they remove gas, the economies of Europe will completely shut down. They supported Africa ultimately in putting gas, taking away crude, but putting gas into a transition zone. In other words, we will keep it there as long as we can, until we can find a cleaner energy to replace gas. And so that's why you see the risk going on to look for renewables. Now, the, the, the thing you find is that there's a lot of politics also involved in this. Like I said, I trace for you the uh, hard biomass all the way to coal, all the way to nuclear, all the way to coal, uh, crude, all the way to gas. What happened once the Ukraine war started? Nuclear that had been banned for about 10 years, the nuclear plants all began to work again. Europe brought back the nuclear energy, but they said, well, in the absence of the gas, Soviet Union, Russia, we're going to be stranded. Coal, which had been the worst pollutant in the environment, some of the coal fields will begin to get back and to begin to work. So there's a lot of politics involved. So, so that's why sometimes I ask a question, and which is why Africa gets caught up in the politics of it, saying, this is just targeted at us as usual. Never let to us to catch up. But my answer to that is, get yourself ready for renewable, invest in renewable, and try and deal with your resource as a local resource. If you refine all of them today, so we're missing all the needs of Africa in terms of a job political market capture, and we're able, quite frankly, to meet all our local needs, you'll be fine. So when they're moving, you're moving, but then within your locality, you can at least use what it is you have. That's, that's the philosophy of this. Yes. Thank you very much, sir. My question is very direct. You were MD of NNPC when NNPC was under the government, and now right now, as of last year, NNPC transition to becoming a limited entity company. First question: Did you see that happening when you were MD? Did you envision that you plan for that? Plan for what? So the transition of NNPC. Yes, yes. That's one. Two. When you were NNPC. Um, Director, general managing director. General, okay, good yes, yes, director. Yeah, okay. What did you do differently? What did you do differently? Very good. 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 Very good.
The last one came to Seoul was in 2016. So when they met him, by addressing the pricing issue, they said that subsidies never be sustained by this country. And until deal with the subsidy issue so that prices, products are properly priced and avoid illegal exports of petroleum products, you not, not get away from uh, uh, not away from uh, kings. So that was one. Two was that I met, for example, uh, just I'm just taking a summary. Two was that I met, for example, the debtedness to the IOC is in the tune of almost nine million, nine million dollars. The effect of that, sorry, seven point five million dollars. The effect of that was that they refused to make investments in Nigeria and 10 years of Viking going while we were putting fresh money into this country. Negotiating very hard with them and getting the approval of the president, I was able to negotiate the fees repayment of this 7.5 by asking them to write up 1.5 million to the Nigerian government, which they did. For the next five years, I negotiated that that would pay for new oil so they don't touch existing income to the government. So we go and find new oil. Pay you from it, um, and that's how we're able to continue to eliminate that. And with that, there was a promise. There were promises of about 40 to 20 billion on the two yearly cycles investment in this country. Some of that started. We are trade seven, for example, or trade eight. Began as a result of some negotiations. Um, Restructuring of energy was the key for me. When the president appointed me, his focus was how do we clean up energies. He just believed that a lot of fraud had taken place. And if you read without having to give a biodata of my, my work there, all I did to was to so restructure the company. In May of 2016, for the first time, NMP became more visible at that point. And the restructuring came from bringing in the right people from all over the country, creating the line of the right structures. Those structures are still the structures that are, that are happening today. Now, did I envisage my... Did I envisage... The transition to NMC Limited? Yes, I did, because I was a fundamental um, participant in the uh, um, uh, Petroleum Industry Act um, um, Regulatory Framework Development. In fact, the, the draft that I, that I helped develop and work hard was passed by the Saraki um, Assembly, was rejected by the presidency because of a few concerns and sent back. The current draft um, contains things that I'm not quite sure and the right things to do. And I'm sure that the any government will take it back to the assembly because my members are important for it to work well. What was going really limited um, was it important? It is. Because we, we need to find a way in which NMS will be out of the strap of the government and run as a professional company, just like the run and so on. They will get their own investments, they will get their own returns. What we need to do is to create a fine line between their business and managing the foreign government's uh, resources in terms of uh, 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 joint, joint venture agreements with foreign companies, in terms of PSC and NMS. How do we ensure that we to prevent those so they don't get into the ports of NMPC financing and go straight to government? But other than that, managing NPDC, which is located here, managing your gas fields, um, and all the managing your downstream operations, which is very huge, looking uh, like a strategic reserve. NMPC needs to do the same thing as the other group is doing as a big division. So I supported it and worked with them in the same thing. I mean, what I'm saying is the nomenclature that it is today. And sometimes I ask my classes uh, when I teach in other universities in Nigeria, I said, who are the four better gainers of that UIB? And who are the four worst losers of that UIB? Can you answer that question? Are you familiar with UIB? Okay, all right. For the, four, the four top gainers who will be an NPC and of course the, the uh, administrative structures of uh, upstream regulatory council and downstream regulatory council. So we that. Those will be first. Second, with the Nigerian government, because of the huge fiscal changes that have happened, which will increase you know, the dimensions of what is actually going to the government. Third, you know, definitely will be investor friendly oil companies who will have less because they don't know what's going to perform. Independent joint ventures of them. We'll be able to operate without all the sort of people that will be nice to need and games and the rest of the world. So those will be gains. The losers, the first will be the Minister of Petroleum. Because what has happened is that all the parts of the Minister of Petroleum have disappeared. And it's not the world of NMPC, it's not the world of all the people who are in the street. And he doesn't have an independent technical team, which is part of the program. 
can be to develop policies in a way to be able to balance that with what is given by the Australian Council to come in and make the right and something like that. So, it's going to sign largely as a policy regulator without his own returns, depending on the agency that is defending to feed him into what he needs to do. So, it's very important for the person to Should he have left the board of NPCS? Once and once private, you need to find give the proper private parents to that feeling that it is that they are basically going to go there. What other factors are still there? Of course, the host communities. The time, in my view, has come for us to move, make that very major move from what we have now to ownership of resources by communities. And all the government institutes handle the value and tax it. So that, that encourages everybody also to be the resources and that's not part of this structure of all of the city that does not have oil, that does not have other resources that are put into this country. We need to begin to apply the market to the other side of the government. So uh, I think that should have answered some of those that we've been under election. Third one. Fourth one. Thank you, sir. My question is around uh, the politics oil sector using Nigeria as a history. As a former GMD of NNPC and former Minister of State for Petroleum, I've got no doubt that uh, you must have encountered the politics of oil subsidy. I want to ask one, is there oil subsidy in this country? Number two, assuming there is subsidy and the subsidy is completely removed like the government have promised to do, what implication would that have on the Nigerian economy? Thank you, sir. Yes, the answer to the first question is just the subsidy. There's no, there's no pain around it. Uh, I know, 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 Frankly, if we had followed what we did in 2016, what we did in 2016, 
we matched the current price. We didn't predict what it would be in relation to the If the price go up and down, it will go to the In fact, the first two prices went down, we can the price. I got to find out a lot of work on the same competition amongst themselves. I go to one place and they said, I think people less and better because their learning was special. If we want to do that motivation, we will have a substitution today. Somebody will come to that place. Thank you.
I still count him. While I was uh, a law student many years ago, you know what that means. The lecturer delivered a lecture to law students back then, and I was one of them.
ਅੱਛਾ ਲੱਗਦਾ